All right, folks, I think we're gonna get started. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, lovely. So I'm Chris Nemechek. I'm the director of the Center for the Liberal Arts, and we have all come this evening to enjoy our final visitor with the Call 300 series. So thanks for uh, turning out, and I have no doubt that you will enjoy this. Um, we are going to work with the Poll Everywhere again tonight. Um, however, we do not have a board to write the information on, so I'm going to give it to you right now. Um, so it's the same address and so forth from last time, if you happen to have that in your phones. I have no reason to think that you would, but um, it's so it'll be pollev.com. Slash Christine. Oh, look at how what's happening there. I'm going to quit spelling everything for you now. So it's Christine N E M 037. Or you could text 22333. The question for you guys is not live yet, but I'll, as soon as I sit down and so forth, we'll make it live. Okay? Um, all right, well, we're delighted uh, to have Setsuko Thurlow with us uh, here this evening, and I know she's visited some of your classes uh, this week as well. Uh, before we start, I just wanted to thank a few um, folks for helping us with our Call 300 courses this semester. Um, the Dean's Office of Arts and Sciences, the program in Japanese Studies in particular helped for this evening's performance, or performance, this evening's gathering. I won't be performing later, <laughs> she can rest assured. Uh, and the 100 Years of Women Celebration Committee has also been supporting us um, throughout, the, uh, throughout the semester. So without further ado, I'm gonna ask Michael Cronin, who is the faculty member uh, and CLA fellow who suggested um, Setsuko to to be part of our series on ceremony. Thanks, Chris, uh, and thank you, everybody, for coming tonight. Uh, when the theme of ceremony was announced, I started to think about what are the most important ceremonies in Japanese society, uh, and certainly one of the most important is the ceremony uh, every August 6th to commemorate uh, or to mark the uh, dropping of the atom bomb on the city of Hiroshima. Uh, the memorial ceremony uh, is held every year to remember the victims uh, and also to pray for world peace. And then I thought of today's guest, Setsuko Thurlow, who has participated in that ceremony uh, as a hibaksha, which is to say a survivor of the A-bomb. Uh, it's a very special, unique role in Japanese society uh, that comes with a responsibility to share testimony of that day. Uh, and as I thought more about it, I realized that that act of giving testimony is also a very important ceremony that Setsuko Thurlow conducts many, many times throughout the year to thousands and thousands of people across her lifetime. Uh, Setsuko Thurlow went on to college in Hiroshima after the bomb, graduating from Hiroshima Jogakuin University, a women's university. And she got a grant to continue her studies in the US here in Virginia. So she has a connection to Virginia as well. She studied in 1954 uh, in, at Lynchburg College, studying sociology there. She went on to the University of Toronto, where she lives now, uh, and received her master's in social work there. But it was in Lynchburg in 1954 that she began her activism uh, on preventing nuclear proliferation when she first spoke out uh, against uh, the testing of the hydrogen bomb at Bikini Atoll. More recently, that activism has led her 
to be one of the founding members of ICANN, the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons. And uh, her activism as part of that group uh, experienced a great victory recently, which I'll let her tell you more about in detail. Uh, but as a result of that activism, or as a, as a recognition of that activism, in 2017, uh, Setsuko accepted the Nobel Peace Prize on behalf of ICANN. She's received several other honors throughout her life. The city of Hiroshima named her an ambassador of peace in 2014. And she was also named an officer of the Order of Canada in 2007 from her adopted homeland. So please uh, join me in welcoming Sets for Thurlow. Uh, we're going to get started tonight um, with a question from one of your colleagues. We have two students on the stage with us from two different classes. I'm going to let them introduce themselves, and, uh, and then you can start with the first question. Uh, hi, I'm Greg Messenger, and I'm taking Cal 300, the Japanese city. Um, and I'm Anne Catherine, and I'm taking the politics of inequality. Um, so I have a question, which is, Setsuko, what was the day of the bombing like? What was the day of the bombing like? It's a looking, is it? Yes. OK. <laughs> I'm delighted to be here. And I'm delighted to have the opportunity to share with you what I experienced on that day. <clears throat> is that clear? Yes. Okay. Well, I was a 13-year-old grade 8 student. In those days, Japan was losing badly against USA. And uh, we hardly had the regular classroom work. We were mobilized by the army and by the city office and to go to the factories uh, to pack the cigarettes, to send to the front line, or to be taken to the farms, and to help with the harvest and the rice planting, and so on, and so on. Now, that day, August 6, 1945, I was at the Army headquarter because about three weeks prior to that, I was selected to be a part of the group of 30 girls who had to learn how to decode um, top secret the army was handling. And we learned it quickly. And on that very day, August 6th, that was Monday, that was our very first day to work as uh, decoding assistant at the army headquarters, which was one mile from the hypo center. And I was on the second floor of the wooden building. And at 8 o'clock, we started the morning assembly. And the major was giving us a pep talk. Well, you have been trained well for this. And this is the day you start demonstrating your patriotism, the loyalty to the emperor, and so forth. We said, yes, sir, we will do our best. At that moment, I saw in the windows the bluish-white flush. Then my body started flying up in the air. I still have that sensation. And when I regained my consciousness, I found myself in the total darkness and silence. And I could not move. So I knew I was faced with death. Strangely, I wasn't panic stricken at all. I just faced the death. Then I started hearing whispering voices of my schoolmates around me. Mother, help me. God, help me. So I knew I was not alone. Then all of a sudden, somebody 
started pushing my left shoulder and said, don't give up, don't give up. I'm trying to free you. You see the sunlight, sunlight coming from the opening. Move toward that, crawl toward that as quickly as possible. That's what I did. And by the time I came out of the rubble, the building was on fire. That meant about 30 girls who were with me in the same room were, were burned to death alive. And as I stepped out, I saw the outside world. Although it was morning, it was dark like twilight, perhaps because of all the soot and smoke and the particles rising up into the air in the mushroom cloud. And then, as my eyes got used to the darkness, I started seeing the moving dark object approaching to me. Well, those happened to be human beings, but I couldn't recognize as a human beings. They simply did not look like human beings. The hair was standing up, parts of the bodies were missing, and the burned, the blackened, the swollen, and skin and flesh were hanging from the arms and from everywhere. And some were carrying their eyeballs, and one by one, they collapsed onto the ground. As they did, their stomach burst open, intestines stretch out, and so on. Anyway, the soldier said, you girls, the, myself and two other girls who survived, you girls joined that procession and escaped to the nearby hill. Well, we learned how to step over the dead bodies and escape to. And strange thing was silence. In a situation like that, we tend to think of panic situation, people screaming, hey, I'm in trouble, help me. No, that's not my memory. It was as quiet as death city. And people were simply whispering, water please, water please. That's all the physical and psychological strength they had. Now, at the foot of the hill we escaped to um, was a huge military training ground, about two football fields inside. And by the time we got there, it was just packed with the dead bodies and dying people. And dying people were still begging water, but we had no cups and containers to carry the water. So we went to the nearby stream, washed off the blood, and tore off our blouses and soaked them in the water and dashed back and put it over the mouth of the dying people who just sucked in the moisture. That was the level of so-called rescue or support work we could give. I quickly looked around, but there was no healthcare professionals. Of course, they too were killed by the bomb. About 80% of the doctors, I, I think, they were killed. The remaining number of the healthcare professionals working at somewhere else, I heard, but not where I was. Anyway, um, we spent the rest of the day just repeating a rather pathetic job, but that's the only thing we could do to be helpful. And when the darkness fell, we just sat on the hill, and all night we watched the entire city burn. That was my first day, and um, I lost nine of my family and relatives, and 351 schoolmates from my own girls' school. But you know, at that time, 
about seven to eight thousand grade seven and grade eight students from all the high schools were brought to the center of the city to do some physical labor for the army. And above them, the bomb was detonated about 600 meters above. And I learned that in the center of the detonation, the temperature was over beyond one million degree Celsius, I think. But that huge fireball descended down to the ground. And by that time, temperature came down to three, four thousand degrees Celsius. With that kind of heat, any human being walking or working on the streets or on the buildings, um, they were simply vaporized. Um, and carbonized, and uh, many of my schoolmates, including my own sister-in-law who was in, in the, supervising them. So, um, living in the aftermath was phenomenally difficult. Some people said those survivors envy the dead. Um, well, <clears throat> the people from the neighboring community came into the city in search of their loved ones or to provide some rescue. But they too became contaminated by the radiation. So, it's not just the people who were there who were victimized. The people who came in to rescue became victimized too. Um, the doctors didn't know how to deal with the medical condition. If people had a high fever, they thought maybe this was scarlet fever. They just didn't have any knowledge of the medical condition to be caused by the radiation. That was such a new thing. Um, many people who were outside were burned so badly, uh, they ended up having a very heavy, thick scar on their faces, on the bodies. And this was hard for the girls, especially uh, in the marriageable age girls. So they just hid themselves. They couldn't be on the street. And some women produced deformed babies. Of course, we were under occupation, so we don't know exactly how many, but we have seen many pictures. The deformed babies. You see, the babies who were in the womb of the woman, um, the, the brain development stopped, so many had the condition called the microcephalic, the very small brain, and with the retardation and so forth. Um, general uh, lack of energy, oh, excuse me, a bit. <clears throat> so the Unfortunately, a very severe case of uh, social discrimination started. Well, don't let your son be, marry, be marrying those girls who were there when it happened. 
they would have the uh, deformed babies. Oh, that kind of rumor started, and the girls, especially marriageable age girls, had a very hard time. And of course, employment, those people who suffered hardly any energy, so they were not employable, and uh, people had to go outside of the city, but the people didn't want them to be in their homes and so on. So, so some people had no choice but to spread the old newspaper on the ground and slept in the city. And they are the first one who started dying. Well, general symptom at that time was the loss of hair. I lost, not completely, quite a bit, the internal bleeding, diarrhea, and so forth. Um, I want to jump to the post-war period. Uh, when the General MacArthur came to Japan, he said, well, he came to Japan to, demo to demilitarize Japan and to democratize Japan. But you know, as far as Hiroshima and Nagasaki were concerned, they, he did completely opposite things. Uh, anything disadvantageous to US forces were forbidden to be published in the paper. I know some papers, including Asahi, would stop publication. Um, worse still, they started confiscating survivors' personal writings, like diaries, correspondence, or the people who had such pain just had to express their pain, so they write tanka or haiku or whatnot. All these had to be taken away, photographs, films, even medical charts. All these things um, were confiscated. They were shipped back to the United States. So, not only the hunger, homelessness, and discrimination, and all the social ill survivors experienced in the post-war period, but there was such strong uh, psychosocial political oppression for the following seven years while under the occupation force. Um, Anyway, I, I can one important thing is that um, among the citizens, among the survivors, there was a lot of discussion, debate. Now, who did this? How come we had to suffer this way? And a lot of people wanted to point the finger at the United States. And a lot of other people said, no point in just fingering, uh, pointing the finger at the US. History would tell. People would find out. Instead of who did it, who done it, well, let's look at the whole way of life. Let's put ourselves on a higher plane and have more philosophical approach to this issue of mass murder. Well, to make it simply, citizen came to be simply critical of what the United States did. That doesn't mean they forgive that act of 
huge violence, but instead of wasting time, but our energy must be devoted for the prevention of similar thing ever happen again. What we suffered is, should not be repeated ever anywhere on earth. So I think almost the entire city became pacifist at that time. Um, so peace became a very important uh, focus on the city life. Um, well, we teenagers too um, just made a vow among ourselves. We are going to devote our life to ensure that this would never happen again. But of course, in a lifetime, uh, you don't just make one vow and live with it. From time to time, you have to renew that commitment. And that has been the, part of the pattern of my life. But anyway, that was the beginning of my. Then, as you mentioned, I came to the United States. I got a scholarship. And the media people asked my opinion about what the U.S. hydrogen bomb test at the beginning at all meant. And freshly out of college, very naively, I honestly shared my feeling that the testing should stop. Testing means more sophisticated nuclear weapon. And Hiroshima and Nagasaki is more than enough. Now the beginning, and this got to stop. Then next day, I started receiving unsigned hate letter. And that traumatized me. But I think that experience once again strengthened my vow to go on. Um, and it was not easy. I just arrived in the United States to be traumatized like that. Would I be able to survive in this society? I couldn't go back to Japan. Do I pretend by putting the zipper over my mouth? But I'm glad I was able to come to the conclusion, no, if I don't speak no, and share the firsthand information, what those nuclear weapons do to humanity, who could. It is my moral imperative, and that strengthened my vow to keep talking about it. And I, that's how I have been speaking in the past several decades. But as mentioned just a couple of years ago, uh, July 7th, um, 2017, at the United Nations, our efforts was re rewarded. 188 nations voted for the treaty, new treaty, to prohibit the nuclear weapon. And of course, starting with your country, the nation which had nuclear weapons, try to sabotage it, boycott it, try many things. They are very upset. So now we have achieved that treaty to prohibit the production, use, and transfer of nuclear weapons. But until we reach the final goal of total elimination of nuclear weapons. It's a long way, and uh, um, nuclear weapon states would most likely fight very difficult. But I rejoice we have reached to this point, and uh, well, uh, when the voting was read at the UN, people just 
jumped up and down and they screamed, they were happy. I couldn't do that. I just remained in seat. I was stunned. The whole thing happened so fast. And the tears started pouring down. And the media people came, what do you think? You made it. Well, all I could say was, tell the survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki about this good news as quickly as possible. They have already watched on their TV at home, but uh, my brain wasn't working that way. But the first thing I thought about was hundreds, thousands of people who perished in my city. Uh, by this time, quarter of a million people perished in Hiroshima alone, without counting Nagasaki. So, this is how I'm feeling uh, before I end the, well, okay. Yeah. Thank you, Sorry. thanks for sharing that with us, that's a good. Greg, did you have a question? Uh, yeah, can you talk more about the process that it took you to going from that day of suffering and pain and through the occupation to actually becoming this act activist and this advocate for non-proliferation and the process of getting that um, resolution to the UN? Can you help? Yeah, so the process of becoming an activist Yeah. and then the process of passing the, legisl the, the treaty at the UN. Can, yeah. you, can you describe that process? So in 1954, yeah. you, you spoke to the press. That was your beginning so as an activist? The best contribution I could make to the world was to simply share what I experienced, what I saw. Here is the first-hand information about something called atomic bomb. The world knew about the atomic bomb, but they really didn't know what they did, how they did destruction. So, as much with a limited knowledge, as much as I knew, I just share the truth as I saw it, as I experienced. That's what I have been doing. I don't pretend I'm, a, I'm not a physicist, <laughs> but, uh, but I do remember what I experienced. And that's something no human being should ever, ever experience. So I kept uh, talking about it in church basement, a women's group, high school, university, labor union, Rotary Club, anybody who showed interest, I went and spoke to them. Um, in the United States, um, people are busy justifying. Japanese deserved that kind of thing. That was very painful for me, but, uh, but even in Canada, that kind of uh, response. Justification, justification, that was a war. And to end the war quickly, that was necessary. No, it was not necessary. Mr. Truman knew about that. Well, if I go into history, it's a long story, but I stop. But people were actually starving, and uh, planes were Planes and ships have been destroyed by the U.S. forces. So Japanese government was not functioning. And Japanese soldiers were starving in the Pacific Islands, for example. So Japanese was finished, was not capable of continuing. And the United States knew that. But what they did was to choose the carpet bombing, the cities were targeted, starting with Tokyo. I think in one night, 100,000 civilians were killed. Um, and about 66% of urban centers have been burned that way. And um, certainly, Hiroshima attack, I remember, 
is was uh, indiscriminate mass murder of innocent civilians, children, women, and elderly. But I found many Americans at that time, in, maybe even today, incapable of thinking of Hiroshima Nagasaki as atrocity. Well, shall I stop here? I, we have several questions that have come in from the students. Yeah. So I'll pose one of those for you. Um, your story is clearly a personal and yeah. powerful one. How do you believe these stories will be shared and the use of nuclear uh, weapons prevented 30 to 40 years from now when there is no one left to tell the story firsthand? So you're telling a, your personal story. Yes. But 40 years from now, maybe no, there'll be very few people who remember that day. So 40 years from now, how will that story be told? Yes, this question brings us to the very important point. How do we preserve the memory? And this is a very top priority issue for city of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And uh, they are trying very hard uh, to get the people to write whatever they experience and remember and recruiting the volunteers to learn intimately from surviving uh, people so that they can act as a storyteller of the original survivors. They are really trying to do that, yes. Are there efforts as well to do sort of um, televised interviews or do videos with the actual, with you they, and your, your friends who survived? They seem to be doing very well. I don't live in Japan, so I don't know exactly, but I know that the NHK is very conscientious outfit. They have been producing very good stuff, yes. NHK is the BBC of Japan, maybe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. By the way, my book will be out at the end of the <laughs> <laughs> And the two uh, documentary films of me have been pr produced. Wonderful. Recently. Thank you for letting us know that. Um, so I have, uh, there's quite a few other questions that have come in. Um, let's see here. So uh, one question is related a little to what you said earlier about um, how people hear your story. Do you ever face problems when you share your experience? Are there people who refuse to hear your story? Well, initially, it was very difficult for me to go public. That means I had to expose myself to questions. And, but I try to overcome that. Now, yes, some highly educated people try to nail me down and then difficult time. And for example, suppose Japan had a nuclear weapon first. Do you think Japan would have used it? Well, think like that. Well, here we are trying to find a way of getting rid of them. This is, uh, uh, what I can't think of the particular the word. Hypothetical, the hypothetical. Hypothetical idea. thing. And to me, it was a waste of time. But highly educated people come up with that kind of questions to kill time, to waste time, and to prevent me well, actually, I should be responding more honestly, but that kind of thing bothered me, yes. Well, the fact is, Japan didn't have it, and ne that never happened. Why do we waste time? <laughs> Sorry, I get 
personally <laughs> reacted to that. Sure. <laughs> sure. Okay. Um, and I mean, it, it is such a personal experience. Um, in terms of communicating that, is the process of communicating it, or was it initially helpful in sort of processing what what, what happened, or was it something that was a that was almost another Can you tell me? difficult thing to go through. So when you first began telling the story, yeah. was it simply painful or did it become helpful? A kind of I couldn't therapy? have done it by myself. I had a soulmate. <laughs> he supported me, helped me. If I have to give the formal speech, I write. He always checked my English. Anyway, without that kind of support, I couldn't have started it. I would have dropped many times, but he always spoke me out. What, one of these, well, let me just give you an example. Um, it was August two, one, no, mm, Nineteen eighty-two, when New York had million mark of workers. In, uh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I thought I was going to give you the example. Well, anyway, we've uh, been working you hard here this week. <laughs> What's that? He said we've been working you very hard. Ah. Uh, in August 1982, by the way, one million peace activists gathered together in Manhattan and they marched to Central Park. And that was a glorious day, we marched together. But before I went, I left Toronto. At the airport, American uh, immigration official looked at my passport well, my country is full of peacenik. We don't need additional one. And that's the way. And then they never came back with my passport. He made me lose my flight. And then finally, uh, after an hour or so, and said, okay, you can enter my country. So I said, I'd like to see your boss. He looked su surprised, but I insisted. And I said, and the boss said, I'm sorry about the inconvenience. I said, is this because of the Walton McCarran Act? He said, yes. And that's the act which kept the, what is it, suspicious people out of the United States because tens of thousands of people coming from around the world to the UN and for the march in New York. And those people, many of the people were kept in California. They couldn't proceed to. But anyway, they gave me hard time. They made me miss the plane. And uh, finally, when the boss invited to walk in, I said, no, thank you. I don't feel like entering your country. And then I dashed to the telephone, and oh, I felt so upset and angry. The tears were just running down. I called my husband and said, I am not going. I refused. And he gave me a counseling session <laughs> on the telephone, and I ended up going. But I guess I wanted to show that how my husband constantly supported me. Sorry. This was not exactly a good example. <laughs> I think it was pretty good. <laughs> um, can you talk a little bit, this, this uh, semester we've been thinking about the idea of ceremony. Um, can you speak a little about what it was like to be part of the Nobel ceremony and what role ceremony played in that process? Yes, I think this is fascinating when I read ceremony was the theme I never looked at, looked back my mem A bombing 
experience through that framework. But I think that's a very good one. Um, I, early in my childhood, since my mother was a very devout Buddhist, every morning the first thing she did was to prepare the offering, fresh fruits, sweets, or steaming rice, and give this offering at the alcab. And she expected me to accompany her. So every morning we sat at the alcab and uh, we cited the uh, sutra. As I remember, that was my daily ceremony because for Japanese, ancestor uh, to honor ancestor was very important, very strongly uh, affected by Buddhist faith. I think that was the first set of ceremony. Then my junior high school, senior high school day, I was at the Christian school, and every day, half an hour of chapel. As I look back, that was a very, very important time for my own development. My wounded psyche needed the healing after the bombing. I thought, constantly thinking about life and death, the meaning of life and death. Why did I survive when people around me were killed? Why, why, why? I had a million whys. And that structured time, every day I have this time to think about life and death. That was a tremendous ceremonial thing. That was the important time. But let me tell you something special. Um, my own sister and her four-year-old child were on their way to the doctor when the bomb was detonated. Oh, they turned out to be unrecognizable chunk of flesh to me. They lived for a few days. When they died, soldiers came. They dug up the hole in the ground, threw the body, poured the gasoline, threw the lighted match. And with the bamboo, they kept turning the bodies. Oh, stomach is half burned, and the brain is not even started. Such crude remarks. 13-year-old child just stood there and watched this ceremony, you know, unceremonious cremation, so-called cremation. There was no dignity, human dignity associated with this kind of ceremony. My parents were there standing. But for a long time, this memory troubled me because I remembered I stood there in a stunned way, not even a drop of tears. What kind of human being am I? I couldn't even shed tears for my dear sisters. And the little nephew, four-year-old child who kept picking water. Only after I got to university, started learning psychology, and especially human behavior in the ultimate condition, then I began to understand. And actually, Dr. Lifton's theory, one of his theory, psychic nami, really helped me. That helped me to forgive myself. Until then, I was blaming myself. What kind of human being am I? I was behaving this way. So that is a very significant ceremony for me. And by the way, that was not a unique experience. Many, many people just stopped reacting. Uh, the cessation of the emotional response, that was happening to us. The 
horror was so massive, so grotesque. That was the only way, I think, our psyche was protected. So, that's part of the ceremony. Mm -hmm. uh, you were thinking about the uh, commemorative ceremony. Occasionally, I have attended that. Usually, on August 6th, in Hiroshima, in the Peace Park, about 50,000 people come together and uh, remember the loved one and pray for them and to renew their commitment to fight for, to work for the abolition of nuclear weapon. Many people feel that is their mission, their responsibility. That's a very important time. Uh, in Nagasaki too, they have it. When I compare both, actually, I feel happier about the Nagasaki one because they invite the survivors to speak at the occasion, and the children and so on. In Hiroshima, a lot of dignitaries, the speaker of the house and prime minister, they keep saying the same thing year after year, and the words and actions are different, and people feel rather unhappy about that. So, maybe this was not asked for, but I said, maybe this is taped. Oh dear, what shall I do? <laughs> I think it's very interesting to hear about both formal and informal ceremonies and the way a very informal ceremony could have such impact and that which was meant to be formal might not because of sort of whose voice is being heard. Mm -hmm. um, it sounds to me like mm -hmm. that mm -hmm. is often more important than the ceremony mm -hmm. or the sort of majesty of the ceremony itself. I have another question from our students. Um, the question is, what do you think we, the young generation, it's not for me, it's from them, <laughs> should do for promotion for peace? What's that? What can the young generation do? These, this generation out there, what can they do to promote peace? What well, I think our parents and grandparents' generation made a mess of this world. <laughs> Yours, as well as Japanese ancestors. And before we pass this world on to the next generation, I think you and I have a big job to clean up this world. Lots to do. And I'd like to ask you, each one of you, to do your part. I don't have to name about climate change or nuclear weapon or race relations. We all know the problem. Let's stop doing it. Let's get involved and try to get rid of them. And uh, from my perspective, I want to see entire nuclear weapon be eliminated. Then we have to do something about institution, a war. And then we have to make sure the world we inherited is fair and just. A lot of injustice we see around that have to be dealt with. So we have lots to do. You know what you can do what's around you. So I won't say any more in detail than that. Do either of you guys want to ask a question or I go to the poll? Um, I can. Okay. So could you tell us about what it was like to receive the Nobel Peace Prize? What was it like to receive the Nobel Peace Prize? Well, I did not receive it. I mean, on behalf of international campaign for the 
for the abolition of nuclear war. This is the global coalition uh, in over 100 nations, over 500 um, NGOs, non-governmental organizations, came together for the same goal. And we worked very hard, but I must tell you, I think the driving force of this campaign was a young people, younger people, shall I say, in 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. We all timers were there too, but we shared our experiences and uh, a bit of uh, wisdom and so on. But I must say, younger people led the movement. They were well-informed people about nuclear weapon issues, full of energy, such creativity, and skill with technology. They knew how to use the computer and the Twitter and all this kind of thing. So they could disseminate information around the world in one moment. And that's how millions of people from around the world came together and made it the big force. Um, what was the ceremony like? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Um, as a result, the Nobel Committee recognized the, the work those younger people did and um, Now, how did I feel about that? I felt, well, actually, the organization asked me to speak, and I thought um, most of the job were done by the younger people, why me? But somehow, they recognized my contribution. My contribution was to speak to the diplomats, the official delegates from the countries and the members of the NGOs. I kept reminding them what they're doing, why they are doing, that more of encouragement, inspirational thing. And um, they appreciated my voice. Um, so, I humbly accepted the opportunity. Well, um, I wanted to bring something from Hiroshima to the ceremony. And uh, I had my mother's tomesode. Some Japanese people would know tomesode with some beautiful Japanese needlework. And I took it apart and have it made as a Western style gown. At least that was one thing I brought from Hiroshima. Uh, it was a very solemn, serious, uh, kind of a stiff kind of ceremony. We had the procession. It's interesting, afterwards there was a press conference. The Japanese man said, I can't, it's hard for me to figure this out. The whole thing was run by a woman. The chairperson of the Nobel Committee was a woman. She made the speech. And the executive director of ICANN was a Swedish lawyer. She spoke. And then I spoke. Three women spoke. And Japanese man had a hard time to understand. <laughs> but... Um, that was great from my perspective. <laughs> um, but um, that night, well, I'm jumping, but that night there was a banquet which I sat next to king and queen and all these glorious setting, but the thing which 
stays in my mind is this. In the middle of the dinner, there was a time for speech. And the man from the Nobel Committee stood up and made a speech. He's a funny, comical man. He just makes everybody laugh. But he's a philosopher. He teaches philosophy, son of former prime minister and a former uh, military man, and the supporter of the NATO and all that background. And at the same table, there was the prime minister, speaker of the house. Prime minister was also a woman too, by the way. <laughs> Anyway, what impressed me about this speech, while he made all of us almost fall out of the chair because of the funny stories he gave, he was telling the prime minister Norway should be signing and ratifying this treaty. That message was very clear. And the prime minister was kind of uh, uncomfortable, I think. But this gentleman, who is a member of the organization, Nobel Committee, which is appointed by the parliament, I understand, right? In spite of his position, in spite of the position of the prime minister, he was giving his peace of mind straight strongly, and he was not apologizing to that, but in a very funny, comical way, but straight. And I thought this was fantastic. So I asked for the copy of his speech. I had it translated, and I had it published in Japan, because that you can never expect in Japan speaking directly to Mr. Abe, can you, do you think there would be courageous enough politician to do that in that country? Maybe I am uh, bi I may be biased, but anyway. I really admire that man's speech. To me, that's the most important memory of that ceremony, actually. Along those same lines in terms of, I mean, in some ways that man was also really speaking, it sounds like, from his, from his heart in terms of what he thought. Um, one of our students is asked um, whether or not you have worked with other survivors to tell their story, to help them to think about actually telling their story. So being supportive of others who maybe are initially not willing or didn't want to tell their stories? Mm -hmm. Helping other okay, stories. Mm -hmm. uh, in Japan, uh, there is an NGO called the Peace Board, which invites young people to, well, anyway. For the 25th anniversary of Peace Board voyage around the world, they invited 100 survivors from Hiroshima and Nagasaki and they asked me to sort of guide this group. And uh, I thought to go around the world, uh, it takes over three months, plenty of time. I thought this would be a wonderful occasion for me to get to know those 100 survivors. And I got the permission to do the interview, one-to-one -one interview with them. And many of them said, well, I was in mother's womb then. I was young, so I don't remember anything. So I am not qualified to talk about it. They were very hesitant, shy to take any anti-nuclear position. But I encourage them, 
Maybe you don't remember. Maybe you didn't experience that. But you grew up in a special environment where your parents experienced this and that. You talk about this and that at home. And sharing that experience, you grew up in that environment. Just talking about that itself would be a starting point. Up until then, they never shared their experiences. So toward the end of three months journey, the stance have changed. Before we got to Tokyo, they said, well, I'd like to do something. I don't know what to do. Where can I go? So I was in the position to make referral to this organization, that organization. So those three months was used very fruitfully, productively. I tried to help them feel it's okay to open your mouth and share whatever you witness. Don't try to make up the story. Um, so I continue that kind of relationship with them. So are you talking about the yeah, that's, working relationship that's a wonderful example. with them? Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. Wonderful. Um, I think we're going to take, I'll, I'll ask one more of the questions from the students, and then um, we will wrap it up. Uh, one of them has asked, what symbols of hope have appeared to you in the 70 plus years since the bombing? What's that? So what signs of hope do you see since the bombing in the past 70 years? The hope. Well, last October, November, and part of December, I was in Hiroshima. I was invited back by my school. And so I spoke with university students, high school students, not only in the city of Hiroshima, out in the mountain, and I made the trip out there. And uh, when people ask, what did you enjoy best? Actually, meeting with the younger generation, visiting the high schools, and listening to what they have been studying, what they have been producing, the, what they have been thinking. And so they explained, and I was astounded, my goodness, that could have been a selected class, but I was so impressed. They were working so hard to keep up or to understand the nuclear weapon situation. Not only that, about development issue and Iran or whatever. Um, actually spending time with the high school young people was the most gratifying, yes. Actually, their teacher told them to watch my speech from Oslo and write their impression of my speech in English and Japanese. And they sent me 100 speeches, a hundred letters from those students. That's why I was determined to visit the school. And that kind of care teachers are taking. They're not wasting time. And uh, some good things are going in some schools, not all the schools, I don't think. But, so I would like to spend next few years trying to facilitate the exchange of those students. Because as I go to the UN, I see a lot of young people coming from Germany or Japan, and they have their own side events at the UN. And they're well prepared, they're debating, discussing the issue. And I look around, and I don't see any Canadian youth and I have been speaking to educators in Canada, we are wasting time. Let's prepare our young people in Canada. So I hope 
this applies to American young people too. A lot is going on over there. I hope you are able to participate in <coughs> participate in those activities. Well, thank you very, very much for sharing your story with us, Setsuko.